Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight, sponsored today by Vertica. Today, William will be discussing analytic platforms should be columnar orientation. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag ADVanalytics. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. To open the Q&A or the chat panels, you will find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change to chat with everyone to enable chat networking with each other. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout. Now, let me turn it over to Jeff from Vertica for a brief word from our sponsor, Jeff. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon, and hello, welcome uh, to all of our attendees here. Uh, my name is Jeff Healy, I lead marketing for Vertica, and as Shannon mentioned, we're a proud sponsor of this webcast, and hopefully you're seeing a screen of the, the, my first slide here, which That's has good. a gentleman, very good, that has a gentleman I'm sure many of you are familiar with based on today's subject, which is probably why you tuned in around uh, columnar architectures. And this is, of course, Dr. Michael Stonebreaker. And uh, Dr. Michael Stonebreaker is really kind of the database guru out there in the industry going back to the 70s when he um, invented Ingress with one of, his, uh, one of his colleagues. And since that time, Postgres and all other kinds of databases out there, but the one we're gonna, gonna cover today's topic is the C-Store. Um, he's a Turing Award winner from uh, 2014, which is the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for Computer Science. Um, incredible uh, mind around databases. And he's got this book called Making Databases Work. Well, why am I talking about Dr. Michael Stonebreaker? Well, he was the co-founder of Vertica, which is where I'm gonna just go into a little bit of detail before I'm passing it off to, to William. And what uh, Dr. Stonebreaker saw here was a tremendous opportunity um, not too long ago in terms of being able to derive insight, from very, very large volumes of data that could not be accommodated by row store databases, particularly more transactional databases, which is where OLAP came around and more analytical databases. Well, one of those was Vertica, right? So many of you may be familiar with Vertica as that column store, as that SQL analytical database, where you can load and store very large volumes of data, like in petabyte volumes, and perform very, very fast analytics against it. Well, how do you perform those analytics? Well, it has 700 plus in database analytical functions, everything from time series to pattern matching, uh, geospatial, you know, the list goes on and on. And you can run those, you can access all those analytical functions through SQL. So you know SQL, you can run, do uh, analytics. And you can do predictive analytics as well because not too long ago, just a few years ago, we took the approach of in database machine learning. And the whole idea was to be able to do end-to-end -end machine learning uh, by virtue of just using uh, SQL. If you know SQL, you can do it create, train, and deploy machine learning models. There are algorithms that come out of the box. Many of them have been around for some time, you know, linear regression, logistic regression, naive Bayes, that you can take advantage of um, uh, and takes advantage of all the, the full volumes of data. Um, so if you want to even score data models from that are written in other languages like Python and you know, very common R you know, programming languages with data science scientists, you can do that. Using PMML, you can transport the models in database and score those models. Again, uh, large volumes of data, no downsampling. Um, we believe, and it's been proven with the, with our customers, that uh, you get better accuracy as well in machine learning models. And then it's also a query engine, right? So within the space, you'll see you know, many um, entrants, very competitive space with some um, vendors just offering a query engine, being able to analyze that data in place. Right? So that's a, also really common. Um, a little bit about our customers. So we've got thousands of customers, um, a variety of analytical use cases. This is the part that really kind of fascinates me with the, within this database industry. Everything from predictive maintenance, Philips has a very large predictive maintenance initiative with their MRI machines. And Vertica is that analytical data warehouse that kind of powers that. Uh, within ad tech analytics, companies like the Trade Desk and Taboola, Trade Desk generates 40,000 reports a day based on Vertica. It's one of the largest um, analytical clusters on AWS. 
uh, 500, 600 nodes, uh, lots and lots of users, concurrency, scale, performance, super important. Um, and then everything from customer behavior analytics, where you get companies like Yes um, within uh, e-retail, making sure that you can do dynamic pricing, live almost to the second, uh, A-B testing to determine which campaigns are performing better for you, to energy trading, smart metering, security analytics around intrusion detection, the list goes on and on, um, particularly around IoT with those large volumes of data for other IoT and all the use cases like Climate Corporation has. This is a software company, was bought for a billion dollars. Their underlying embedded analytical engine is Vertica. Right? This is around agritech, um, make uh, farmers uh, be able to get better yield from their crops. And then into it, when you do turbo, you use TurboTax, analytics behind it is Vertica. That's all for me. I just want to give one last call to action. I wouldn't be doing my job as a marketer if I didn't. So all everything that I mentioned around Vertica is now available as a service. It's called Vertica Accelerator. It's got all the functionality of the core unified analytics platform, but we took away, we automated the setup administration and management, and it runs within the customer's own AWS account to ensure the security is preserved and you can take advantage of discount pricing through your AWS uh, contract. Go to vertica.com slash accelerator. And um, I'm looking forward to the rest of the webcast. Back to you, Shannon, and over to William. Thank you very much. Jeff, thank you so much. And thanks for this great kickoff. And thanks to Vertica for sponsoring and helping to make these webinars happen. If you have any questions for Jeff, feel free to submit those questions in the Q&A section of your screen as he will be joining us in the Q&A at the end of the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for the series, William McKnight. William has advised many of the world's best known organizations. His strategies form the information management plan for leading companies in numerous industries. He is a prolific author and popular keynote speaker and trainer. He has performed dozens of of benchmarks on leading database, data lake, streaming, and data integration products. And with that, I would give the floor to William to get his presentation started. Hello and welcome. Hello. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Jeff. And I, I enjoyed that little walk down memory lane, uh, back to the origins of the columnar ideas with Michael Stonebreaker and so on. Uh, and I was around for some of that. So uh, I've been uh, with it ever since. And um, this is uh, a bit of a, I might call it a soapbox of mine, um, trying to get our clients onto Columnar for their analytic databases. I hope you don't mind. I went ahead and went right for the money shot in the title of the webinar, not something I usually do, but analytic databases should be Columnar. So I want you to see that and then try to prove it to you over the course of the next 45 minutes or so. And uh, if you track me, you know that I'm all about the benchmark. And so we do have some benchmark results to share with you at the end of this presentation to try to try to underscore some of the things that I'll be sharing with you today about uh, turning databases in a columnar direction. And so uh, there's a little bit more about me. I've been introduced, so I will move right along here. And guess what? I uh, My first slide is also about some of the origins of this. Jeff's already talked about it, but uh, there is a paper out there called C-Store that Michael Stonebreaker, as you can see there at the top, uh, was a, an author of. And C-Store C -Store, C -Store is a database management system based on a column-oriented database developed by a team at various universities. And it includes Michael Stonebreaker and a few others. And the latest release was in 2006. So it's not like you're going to go out there and buy C-Store for your column-oriented needs, but Vertica, our sponsor today, is a commercial fork of C-Store and certainly embodies uh, the uh, columnar orientation more than any other out there. Now, relational, now we are squarely in the realm of relational databases today. I'm not talking so much about cloud storage and other forms of storage today. Uh, relational databases have had, I would say, a bit of a resurgence in the past few years when it looked like uh, maybe the world was going in a Hadoop direction there for a while and it turned hard right back to all the goodies that the relational database gives us, uh, not only has given us, but continues to give us. So hopefully you're tracking that space and surely you are using some relational databases somewhere in your enterprise, if not, 
completely just using relational databases in your enterprise. And I'm going to talk about this because it's very important to understanding the value of columnar by looking at the uh, internals, that is, of a relational database. Now, over the years, and I've been with this industry for a long time, relational database design is virtually unchanged. The only thing we've sort of done differently in this probably in the past decade is parallelism. So we're still doing the third normal form, we're still doing the star schema, et cetera, et cetera. And for good reason, we're still doing it too in our practice, for sure. Hardware, however, storage capacity has increased tremendously. So as CPU performance, they've gotten cheaper and transfer rates and seek times have increased only modestly uh, still. Um, now they've increased to be sure uh, what is great performance uh, uh, of a few years ago may not even be good performance today. Uh, I'll admit that. Uh, so we do need these things to get better. We have much more data. We have much more complexity around what we're asking about the data. We have much more concurrency and far less downtime available to us. So these things have to have come aboard, if you will, uh, in the past few years in order to keep up. And they certainly have. But do notice the last bullet I said they've increased only modestly compared to everything else. And what that means is that's kind of left us with where the bottleneck uh, continues to be around analytic uh, databases, analytic queries, and that is in the input output, the IO. So let's build on that a little bit. Now, row-wise database, which is what probably 99% of you are working on uh, today. Now, some of you are also maybe working on some columnar, which is great, but Row-wise databases, and we usually don't even use the term row-wise, we just say a database, but truly that's what they are. They store data in rows. So here you have a sample, some sample rows of a sample table, one, two, three, four, five, six columns. And most of us, even database professionals of multiple decades, only know that the data is stored something, something like this. It looks like something like this. So if you do a select splat from table, this is what you get. Well, this must be what the data is stored like. Well, you're, you're kind of right there. Uh, and I'm gonna show you in, more, in some more detail how that data is stored in a row-wise database in a few moments. But I just wanted to orient us around uh, the row-wise uh, database, how it looks. So sometimes a row-wise database will store well, most of the time it stores all the columns in the order in which they are defined in the catalog, which is the order that you get it back if you do a select splat. So there is some serious ordering uh, importance to uh, the, the columns in a table. However, some of them will occasionally store like data types together and just sort of work out the, the uh, ordering uh, on the way out uh, by looking at the catalog and so on. Uh, and there's different uh, games, I guess you might say, that uh, databases are playing with some of the data in a row-wise database. But generally speaking, all columns have to be stored consecutively for a row. Now, so the data is down there on storage, uh, multiple forms of storage today. But to get it to the CPU, usually it goes through memory. Doesn't always, but usually it goes through memory. The CPU will interact with primary storage or main memory referring to it for both instructions and data. So we have these, I'm bringing your attention to the fact that we have these different caches, L1, L2, other forms of caches, and I call them preprocessors to conserve the CPU. So the CPU is still necessary to process the data in storage. However, L2 and L1 can do a lot and they add a lot of value. However, we're, if we're sending too much data up this pyramid from storage towards the CPU, they can get bottlenecked. And when they get bottlenecked, all the goodness that they provide is thrown out the window and those levels get skipped. Famously, the L2 cache gets skipped quite a bit in the configurations that we have in place today, uh, whether it be on the cloud or in prem. So that's something to definitely keep in mind. And Vertica has a concept around their cache called the depot, by the way. So there are multiple different terminologies out there in regards to really a lot of this, but uh, definitely in regards to this caching. So uh, just be aware, uh, different databases will call it different things. But the data has to come up to the CPU and we can have bottlenecks if we're sending too much in the unit of IO, which is the data block. So I said before that a relational database 
when it's a row when it's when the data is oriented row wise which is probably i would say 95 percent of the time well I, I i take that back that's only if i include operational purposes as well uh, on the analytics side we're getting smarter about this we probably are still about probably 80 percent uh, row wise out there with our implementations anyway what you see here is one value for every column of the of the uh, record okay and you have three records on the page small record like this you would probably have a lot more uh, the data block itself can be uh, different sizes and that's certainly a design consideration anything from 4k to 64k 128k and beyond it depends on how much you want to gobble up in an io and that depends on your query patterns because if your query pattern is one row at a time that's one thing if your query pattern is there's a lot of scanning to be done you want to grab it all in the, in the io so you're going to have bigger page sizes and so on but what i don't show you here is that these records also have a bit of a record header at the beginning of them and of course i do show you the page header and these things called row ids at the end of the page and then there's this page footer which is just primarily used to uh, make sure that everything's in sync within the page. Now, the row IDs are offsets to where the records begin on the page. So if I ask you to go to, I don't know, page three, record two, uh, it can jump three times the size of the page from the beginning of storage, land you here at the beginning of the page, go to the third offset from the end, go to that offset within the page, and there we're reading the, 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 actually I said the second record, didn't I? The second offset, then we're going to go read that second record, the one for Craig Lennox. Okay, great, that's how it works. Uh, what's in the index is actually what we call the, uh, the, the record IDs, which is the, what I just said, the page number and the record ID number within that page. So you can start there at the index and come on in straight to the record that you want and get the rest of the record, if you will, the rest of the record that's not in the index. Okay, okay, that's a lot of words, and I'm sorry for that. Uh, hopefully it all did make a little bit of sense anyway. So um, I'm gonna move on here. Now, in a columnar orientation, and I think you all probably have picked up on the fact that in a columnar orientation, what we're saying here is that the columns are stored uh, consecutively. Uh, get with consecutive values within the data blocks, not the entire record. So what you have are independent areas on storage for different columns. Or you might throw some columns together in what might be called column families or whatnot, containers, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But for now, let's just pretend that each column is in its own block, okay? And obviously, if the number of records, the number of column values as a result, exceeds the size of the block, there'll be multiple blocks. There can be many hundreds, thousands of data blocks for a given column, for a given vector, if you will, uh, on, by some terminology. Uh, and that's okay, but it's still far smaller than if you had the whole record in here, and that's kind of the point. So if you have a lot of queries, that are going to query just selective records, or excuse me, selective columns, uh, either in the select or in the predicates, then you're going to be very interested, I would say, in columnar. And what I do encourage my clients to do is to not, not um, mess around with their design, uh, trying, to, trying to approximate what columnar does for you. I've seen this plenty of times where a client will have kind of gamed their row-wise database to have just some of the columns in one table and then the rest of the columns in another table because of this I.O. problem that we're having. And I don't like to see designs compromised. I want them to be highly managed and implemented directly from the design into the table. So I don't like that. I think that affects manageability. Anyway, what you see here in addition, I want to bring your attention to something here that in this columnar data block, you don't see all that overhead that we saw back here. You, you don't see the row IDs. We don't see the record headers, which I didn't even show you here, but trust me, they're there. We just see the records, the actual column values. I don't know what column this is, but anyway, the reason for that is that since they're of fixed length, they're all gonna be at a predictable offset. 
So 1120 would be for record one, 1121 for record number two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't need an ID map in this case, which saves overhead, which means I can cram more values onto the page, number one, but also means I'm going to grab a little bit more when I do my I.O. And so there are many tricks that we can do through compression to even make this better. And I'm going to get to that. So in a little bit of summary of this section, traditional databases, data stored by row using data blocks, um, 4K to 32K, I, I, like I've said, some of them take you all the way up to 128K and beyond. Uh, hopefully, if you're working, if you're a database professional working on an analytic database, you know what that block size is for the database. It's pretty important in the grand scheme of things. Now, for smaller databases, you're probably not going to see much difference in suboptimal uh, block sizes, but in larger databases, you will for some or maybe a lot of the queries. So it's something clearly worth paying attention to. So if you want to do something rather simple, like calculate the average sales for the A stores in New York, you're going to have to go through this table. You're going to have to select where class equals A, and then you're going to grab all the sales for that. You're going to average it and send that back to the user. So for uh, queries in a row-wise database, traditional databases, you might go through an index to get to just those records that have class equals A, if you have an index on class, for example. If you also have sales in that index, you never have to touch the table. But if you don't have sales in that index, it's not a compound index, you're going to come on over here to the table and you're going to grab all the sales associated with those record numbers. And you're going to aggregate them and do the division and that's how you end up getting the result that's how it works in traditional databases and i'll show you how column works in just a bit but first this concept of mixing columns now i'm going to use the word containers one of the databases out there uses this term but there's many terms for this now there's a lot of possibilities let's say you have a five column table i'm showing you some of the possibilities in terms of the d design these are all columnar, except you could argue that possibility one is really not, because what you did there is you threw all the columns into one container. Now, kind of never mind the fact that there's I show container one and container two. Um, actually, let me address that. The point of that is that sometimes your columnar compression routines and so on, um, they only work within a certain subset of the records within that table. Um, so the containers might be divide, might there might be multiple containers for a given column value just based on size alone. It's not really a design concept. It's just based on the size of the column and the number of records. Um, possibility one is all columns. We threw them all in one container. Um, probably shouldn't have done that. That's just that just looks like a row wise database to me. Possibility two is taking the column idea to the extreme. And by the way, this is the default for a lot of databases out there that are columnar orientation. So if you don't take this in hand, what you're going to get is a container or whatever they call it per column. So we have one for name, one for city, one for state, one for lifetime value, one for birthday. Okay, great. Um, but there's plenty of possibilities where you could combine commonly used columns into a container because they're going to be accessed together most of the time like city and state it depends on your query pattern anybody who says oh, it doesn't really matter about your query pattern just kind of throw the data in here and and we'll take care of the rest uh, they're wrong you you are suboptimal in that in that arrangement for a lot or probably most of your queries so design time if it's done by an expert um, you know, done with all information in hand, I shouldn't say all, I should say, you know, a lot of good information in hand goes a long way. I'm not saying belabor the data based design uh, to no end, but I am saying that it's still a thing out there. By the way, it's kind of a lost art <laughs> because there's so much else that we're attending to these days in terms of the cloud. We're getting distracted with a lot of things, not with our database design, and we should be. We should continue to put emphasis there and on the data modeling and yada yada okay possibility four you have four columns in a container possibility five and so on there's probably i don't know 20 possible combinations here 
with just these five columns. My point is you still have to uh, take this in hand. Okay, so what does a columnar orientation do? What does it look, how does it look different? You know, if you're doing a query. Well, here is a columnar orientation with vertical partitioning of the data. That means every column has its own storage area. It's uh, there's no nobody else in there but date, nobody else in there but store number. They're stored independently. It's kind of like you go to Spotify and you want to play a song. You don't want to play the whole album. You just want to play a song. And that's kind of how we're consuming music uh, today. And that's how we're consuming data as well. So most queries are not going to want all the columns of the table. And hopefully we haven't gamed our design so that it actually does because we have a faulty design. Uh, but in the case of the earlier query that needed class and sales, then it's not going to IO the data, the store number, the state, the category, and whatever else is in here. And we all know customer tables will probably, you know, have dozens to hundreds of columns in them. So consistent data, let's talk about compression. We're start, starting to move into that area. Consistent data types are easy to compress. And these are definitely consistent data types because it, within a vector here, it's going to be all the same values. The resulting storage size is typically less than 50% of the size of the raw data, but it does depend on the columnar compression routine that you choose. And these are some of the common ones that are associated to columnar. Now, they're not necessarily exclusive to a columnar orientation, but their value proposition is much higher when you do have a columnar orientation. Therefore, a lot of these columnar compression, or a lot of these routines are associated to columnar definitions. And like I said about the design, like I said about the, the size of the data pages, like I said about dividing the columns into their column families, all right, all that stuff I've said, hey, pay attention to that. I'm going to say, pay attention to your compression when it comes to columnar as well. Now, some databases will, will let you um, just create the columns and fire away and it will learn learn as it goes and figure out what the best routine is based upon the data that it's seeing in the column and my experience with that is mixed results i'll put it that way um, i would rather see you think about it think about the data pattern which you know pretty much you know the data pattern you know you know what the data is going to look like that's going into a given column when you're creating the column most people do and so that lends itself to what compression routine you should use so let's look at some of them one of my favorites is run length uh, encoding and so let's say you have uh, a bunch of let's say you've um you have a bunch of records uh that have this exact same value for quarter one and they're all stored in sequential order so this is only going to work on probably your leftmost uh, one or two or maybe three columns in a table, depending upon how you cluster the table. But let's say you cluster this table by quarter and I show one, two, three, four, five, six rows here that have Q1, okay. But it could be hundreds, it could be 500. So instead of storing the Q1 value 500 times, let's say, you just store it once in some other table, uh, actually in the column vector, and you just say Q1 is the value for rows one through 500. So you have a start and you have an end. You don't really have to have uh, a start. It could be assumed to be one plus, you know, whatever the prior was, but virtually you have a start and an end to what that value, where that value is gonna show up in terms of row order. So simply all of this quarter vector can be summed up in four short rows, right? Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, because that's all there is. Now, realistically, you probably have, uh, have the year uh, to the left of the quarter. That might be a better thing to compress on. This is just an example, but I'm showing you how you can save a lot. You can save a lot of space. And again, we're trying to optimize that thing that's the bottleneck, which is the IO. So you're going to get a lot less uh, in the I.O., but, uh, but it's a lot more, if, if you follow me. Dictionary encoding. So rather than storing the full value 
of a long text, something like England or United States of America, Japan, obviously countries here, the original size, if it's a fixed length, is going to be 30. I think that's what we typically do, char 30s for country, although I could be mistaken, there could be some that's larger. But anyway, char whatever it is, let's say 30, that's 30 bytes every time. Now, what if you had a, a, a dictionary, if you will, or a thesaurus, as I sometimes like to say, that's somewhere else that says, hey, this is where all the values of England are. So instead of having to repeat England, you just put in the uh, surrogate value, the compressed value, which in, in this case is a zero, a one for the United States of America, a two for Japan, a three for Argentina, and so on and so on. Okay, there's another one for the United States of America down at the bottom. Okay, so that's just one byte. That's just one byte instead of 30. Yes, you had to store a dictionary off the side uh, for this, but that's not going to take up very much space compared to the savings that you're going to get for a large table with a large char that's, that you want to compress. Okay, now here's, some, here, here's an example of how you can have, you can have different compression routines for different column families that you have in your columnar database. You can have in container one here, for example, you can have dictionary compression. And I say local because like I said before, if the table is large, the database is going to cut it off at some point and say, okay, I'm going to create a dictionary for this section of the table. Then I'm going to create another dictionary for this next section of the table. And so on. think about that like as 10,000 rows or something like that. I'm trying to think of what it is in SQL Server. It goes by number of rows. I think it's 10,000. But whatever it is, you have a special dictionary for that. And then you're not storing, uh, you know, you're not storing Smith, Jones, and Johnson all the time, Williams, Jones, and Miller. You're just storing the surrogate. And in my example here, the surrogate is three bytes. So that's fairly meaty in my experience for a surrogate value, for a dictionary value. But if I had tens of thousands of, of, of different rows, I had that super high cardinality. Uh, it probably wouldn't be of a, a lot of value here, but anyway, uh, you could have multiple bytes in there for your dictionary. This is really great if you have uh, low cardinality. Now, state container. Here we have run length encoding. Wyoming, that's in records one through 10. Texas, that's 11 through 25. Florida, 26 to 34, etc. Now, when we cut over to container two here in this example, well, this time Texas is one through six, Georgia is seven through eight. So I think you can see though that unless you have repeating values from row to row, this probably isn't going to be of very much savings to you. So watch out for that. And finally, one I didn't show you another slide on, but it's called delta compression. So instead of actually storing the, for example, birth date, and this works great for dates, but it works for other things as well, like amounts, Any, anything that's not, that doesn't have a wide, wide range of values in them, this works great for. So birth date, uh, it picks a median for the container. Let's say it's July the 4th, 1970. Okay, this first person is plus 73 days of that. Uh, that, that means that Smith's birthday was whatever 73 days is plus July. So what would that be? August, September, October, sometime in October, apparently. That's when his birthday is. Same year. And then the second one, negative 198, minus 198. So subtract 198. But do notice that we're only storing the plus or minus value. We're not storing the 10 bytes of the date. Um, there are a lot of obvious IO advantages to this. Um, if uh, everything's in a really wide range and you have to have a big number in there, probably not as good for you. Something that has uh, everything that is original, eh, that's probably not too good for that either. But dates, values, things like that, yeah, it makes a lot of sense for. So you can have a mix and match of compression within a columnar database. Now, eventually, a database has to bring everything together and show you the results, and that's called projection. So there's the selection part where it's doing everything in terms of the predicates and then the projection parts bringing stuff back, right? So in row stores, it removes unneeded columns from the results set, meaning it materializes things 
uh, early because it's already fully well, it's already fully materialized in the rows, and that's what it works on. What you don't want to have is a column store that's actually doing the early materialization, and it doesn't really have a columnar optimizer, but it has a row optimizer. So what it has to do is take those columns that simulate a row and then throw it into its optimizer. And that's called early materialization. Most of the databases avoid that, although some of them still do it and still have some pieces of that left in their optimizer. And so that's something to watch out for that's going to be suboptimal. And I think I'm going to show you primarily with an example. So let's look at this example here. We have two vectors, product ID 414. Now, hopefully by now you know what that means. All right, that's your run length encoding. So what that is saying is that the value of four is in rows one, two, three, and four. So they're all four. Store ID, normal stuff here. The values are 2131. We're talking about four rows in this in this little table. So we're selecting customer ID and price from sales. This is the sales table, all right? Where product ID equals four and store ID equals one, obviously pretty simple. Now, which rows is product ID equal to four? All of them, okay? Which rows is store ID equal to one? Two and four. I'm going to ignore the fact that usually we start counting at, at zero. So two and four. So selection occurs, the bit mapping occurs, on the various vectors and it highlights with a one those record numbers that meet the respective predicates and since we said an and what it's going to do now is and them together so what what that leaves us with is records which two and four right and so then it goes out to the customer id and the price vectors and it says well give me the third value for each of those and let me glue them together. That's my glue right there. Okay, bottle of glue. Uh, and then it constructs the queries. And notice that it's doing this late. It didn't have to glue everything together early and then do the row thing. All right, it didn't have to do that. So pretend there's 100 columns in this table and you can see where the value comes from. And there's your result. Yay. Okay, now, before I show you the benchmark and give you some real numbers here to, uh, to work with in your in your designs, uh, do note this trend. Uh, have you heard of operalytical or translytical? Some of those databases, and it's kind of gray as to as to who's in the category. I won't go into who who's there and so on today, but some databases put data into both structures. That's right, both structures. Now, many, many years ago when we started with databases, we didn't have the, such a thing as an analytical database, right? Remember that? We just had the operational database. And some of us still use operational databases for our analytic needs. I'll put that aside for the moment. But um, we do have this whole set of analytic databases. We all know who they are. Uh, you know, okay, Snowflake, Redshift, BigQuery, Vertica, uh, Actian, uh, SQL Server, uh, the analytical uh, SQL Server that is, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So, some databases will put the data in both, so it's storing the data both ways, and then the optimizer will look at the query and go, hmm, which one's it going to be better at? And this is why they call themselves operalytical or translytical, because they can do both, because they store the data two ways. That's how that works. And so the optimizer or the user determines which one to use, because you can, you can say, okay, use the columnar one, or Use the row one, depending on what kind of query it is, if you want to outsmart the, the optimizer. And by the way, don't think that that's a, a bad thing to do, trying to outsmart your optimizer. You still have to do that as a database designer. The optimizers are not good enough to where we can turn our brains off and just throw everything over to it. Not in an enterprise workload that is at a scale, okay? So for the benchmark that I'm about to show you the results of, we use SQLite for row-oriented. Everybody's familiar with SQLite, right? And we grabbed and go with this thing called DuckDB, which we like to grab and go when we need a columnar example. I don't think anybody would necessarily take that to production, but it's great for processes, processing and storing tabular data sets. It works with CSV and Parquet files. You can do interactive data analysis with it, like joins and aggregating of multiple large tables. It works with concurrency. 
So we have done, and that's my little analysis of duck debate, but we have done much, much bigger benchmarks many times over. And this is why I'm on this soapbox, because I've actually done it in practice and seen the, the changes that it can make not only in a benchmark, but all the way into production and beyond for our clients. So I encourage you to think about this because a lot of us are out there wondering, well, how can we add some value you know, to our environment? Well, maybe the, the way you add some value is you orient your data warehouse. I know you've had it 10 years. You didn't think about columnar 10 years ago and, and now it's gonna be hard, but it still might be worth it to spec a project uh, that works, that you know, you build, you do concurrently and orient your data warehouse and your other analytical stores in a columnar way. It's gonna improve the performance. Let me show you how, how much. Okay, so here is our first test. Now I'm gonna show you some inserts and I'm gonna belabor the inserts because columnar, let's think about this. Columnar is not gonna be as good for inserts, right? Columnar is not gonna be as good for loads, right? Because every column has, every row has to be broken apart into its respective columns or column families and thrown into their respective storage units. So it's gonna be, it's not one size fits all, it's not take the whole row and put it in one place, right? It's putting it in 10 places, in 20 places, in 100 places, right? So it's gonna take longer. So in my example here, it's a small example. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine columns, it looks like. So nine columns means, in our example, uh, one column, uh, every column has its own storage. So that's nine break apart. So here you have the first 10 rows and 100,000 rows got inserted in 80,920 milliseconds or 809 microseconds. That's 1.3 minutes for those of you that care about the conversion. Columnar took 1108 microseconds. So a little bit longer, a little bit longer. A lot of people think, well, I can't do columnar because it's going to blow out my load window. Now, if you're pushing up against your load windows, if you have uh, problems there, then you don't want to add to it with this. You got to fix some problems otherwise, right? Uh, but if you have cycles there and you really want to optimize your selects, I think uh, columnar makes a lot of sense. So let's look at a, another example. Insert 10,000 low cardinality items. So we have a smaller table. We have 10 rows. Uh, 10,000 rows were inserted in 737 microseconds versus columnar 793 microseconds. Oops. And so it's a little bit longer. Once again, it's a little bit longer. Um, I don't know the percent there, but it looks like it's on the order of less than 10%. Okay. So yeah, you have to pay a price for this, all the goodies for a columnar. And this is where you pay that price. One more time. Let's pay the price again. Create a very small table. Here's 10 rows. You're inserting a million records, okay? 519 microseconds versus 535. It's getting closer because you got you don't have as many uh, different storage units for three columns, but it's still more for columnar. No doubt about it. Now, let's, let's, let's move to happy state. Let's talk about the selects. This is where you get the benefit, right? And this is where most people care about having the most benefit in your selects. So select last name from customer where state equals, and I did 50, all 50 states, one, one query per. So how long did those 50 queries take? 7,845 microseconds. And in the columnar, it took 3,316 microseconds. That's less than half, less than half. So, oh, that seems pretty good. That is pretty good. And in the columnar, you, there's no indexing because the columns are, you know, the values are already broken apart. So there's that as well. So that's what it did on just pure select. Single table aggregation. So we're going to get a little bit more complicated here. And without diving too deep into this, 2,611 microseconds for a row, 704 for columnar. Wow. That's 3.7 times the savings for columnar. And indeed, the more complicated it gets, like this one, here we have one, two, three, four, five queries, okay? 
And the difference here is nearly eight times, nearly eight times the performance for columnar versus row. Same queries in the two different databases. One's a row database, one's a columnar database. And so hopefully you can see here the manifestation of some of what I was talking about earlier in the presentation. I was talking about how the columns take up their own storage and so on. And by the way, some of you are working in cloud storage today, as are we. And this same principle applies to databases like Cassandra and HBase. They're not really databases, all right? Uh, applies to data stores like Cassandra and HBase uh, that break apart the, the file into its respective columns. And so that's why those are so great in that world. Partly why, okay, there's more to it. But. Okay, benchmark conclusions. Columnar is a little slower to load, but much faster on queries. How much faster? 2.3x faster on simple single column scans, 3.7 on simple aggregations, 7.2x on an analytics query with a three table join. I wanted you to have some walking around relative numbers to think about. Uh, in your head uh, to go along with this presentation so that you can understand what the value proposition might be for turning your database to columnar or I will say implementing columnar in a better way than perhaps what you're doing. So in summary of the overall presentation, columnar databases is an alternative to row storage, stores each container independently, container being a column or multiple columns that you throw together. It addresses the idle CPUs and the disk bottlenecks, the IO bottleneck that we still have with us. It's great for compression. I showed you some of the compression routines. It's best when there's a lot of data, right? That's going to magnify the, the, the differences. Long rows, because short rows, you, you don't have a lot to break up there. And when you can isolate the loads, that's a nice way of saying when you don't mind a little bit more time spent on the load or the inserts. And it's great for high column selectivity queries. And what I mean by that is whenever you are selecting, I'm just gonna throw a number out there, but 25% or less of the bytes in the records that you're touching, I call that a high column selectivity query. I have done uh, uh, studies with clients and to size them up for columnar and looked at their analytic queries and I have found uh, multiple times that well over 75% of queries that are deemed analytical actually are high column selectivity queries. We, we were not out there doing select stars when it comes to analytical queries. Sometimes we are, but not very often. So <clears throat> therefore there's a lot of green field here for columnar still. Uh, and as we get all kind of wrapped up in the the 10 to 20 things that we can be doing to make our databases better for our internal clients and our external clients, this has to rise pretty close to the top of the list in terms of what will make that better. And that's why I say analytic databases should be columnar. Back to you, Shannon, to see if we have any questions. William, thank you so much for another fantastic presentation. If you have questions for William or for Jeff, feel free to submit them in the Q&A portion of your screen. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording of this session, um, along with anything else requested throughout. So uh, diving in here um, to both of you, you know, can the columns be variable size? Um. I'll start, uh, columns can be variable size. That just introduces an ID map kind of thing to the, uh, to the data block. Um, now what some columnar databases will do is they will try to avoid that. And unless there's real high variability within the column sizes themselves, it'll force it into a fix, but it doesn't have to be fixed. Now I'll turn it over to, to Jeff. No, you, you covered that one, William. That's exactly right. Uh, the columns can be variable in size, so you covered it for sure. Okay. So you spoke about load, William, you know, but what about insert? Yeah, I mean, insert's going to face the same thing. It's just, it's just a smaller load, really. 
So the, the, uh, what I showed you here was a lot of uh, inserts. These were inserts. Whoops, it's running away from me. Um, these were inserts. And uh, so I actually showed inserts, not loads, but regardless, uh, you're talking about the same kind of thing. A load is going to be doing this, you know, a million times, whereas what we did is a million inserts. Uh, now, would you do one versus the other? It, it depends. It depends on the nature of the data availability that you're putting in the, into the table. So if it's more of a trickle type of thing. It'd be certainly more like an insert, but yeah, definitely we still load, we still do a lot of loads and that would experience some of the same, in my experience, some of the same relative differences to loading a uh, row versus column. And the only other thing I'll add there, William, it's just around data loading with Vertica is that there's a bunch of different ways you can do that, right? So yeah, copy statements, very popular. You also can integrate with Kafka, um, we've got a Kafka connector there. Um, and the only other thing I'll mention is, uh, there's also ETL, of course, in the industry, but a lot of our customers use the ELT approach yeah. with Vertica to use some of those analytical functions for data preparation. So just more around data loading. There's a lot, there's a revolution going on in data loading um, yeah. these days. It's it's not definitely not, as you mentioned, you know, ETL only anymore. There's there's really five to ten viable ways to load any table out there in production now. And that's another area that would that we all need to be looking at. Absolutely. So for null value columns, um, will the position be reserved in vector with nothing or um, that's handled in a different way? Oh, I like these. I like these technical questions like this. It, uh, it shows that um, uh, people were following <laughs> the detail that we were putting out there. So, uh, I, you know, Jeff is going to be able to say how Vertica handles the null, but I'll just say generally speaking that um, instead of the, the pre-byte, if you will, that goes in front of a column, normally there'd be an actual byte that gets stored uh, alongside the column to indicate whether that column is of a null, is null value or not. And in which case you should ignore whatever happens to be in the rest of the bytes. And what you can what can also happen there is the <clears throat> the columnar databases database can can compress all that out all the other bytes out and say oh this is the null I don't have to store the ten bytes the hundred bytes whatever whatever the actual value is because it's null and so it can compress that out of course that does make for a variable length record which means you have to add the ID map and that bit of overhead. So these are all some of the, the pros and cons of it. Yeah, well, you've been giving me more credit there. I'm gonna have to, uh, <laughs> have to uh, dig and I'll put the answer in the uh, in the chat. Sorry for that. <laughs> no, no problem, no problem at all. This is great. I love it. Um, so it seems that columnar databases de-aggregates a record. How does the columnar database uh, associate different columns back to a single record? Oh, I'm sorry, well, Jeff. That's, yeah. that's, it, that's the magic. I mean, that's the glue that I showed before. And, and I mean, we can sit here and, and kind of intellectualize, you know, how it does that. Um, but there was, there's a lot of work to, 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 into doing it. So when some of these databases out there that were row based to begin with have added a columnar uh, element to it. And I think that's great, by the way. I think if you're in one of them, you should definitely check that out. Uh, but it took them a long time to do that. That's one of the the hardest things to do for a a database vendor. So I mean, this is these are this is years in the making to to be able to to provide that option to you. But in general, I mean, I can think it through here that it goes everything is is of an of an offset. Each each uh, container, as I showed you in the example, each container has each has an independent column value. And each container has a different way of getting at the offset to uh, a certain record number. And what it would do is simply go to that offset in each container, which is going to be different. And it's going to pull that, pull that all into memory and uh, connect them up and present that to you. And you have your result. Something like that. <laughs> I love it. 
So what is the difference in modeling approach to take advantage of columnar advantages and minimizing load overhead? Okay, well, modeling approach, this is where I say modeling is about the business. Modeling should be, should reflect the business. Even at the, I don't like to do a lot of quote unquote physical modeling because then I think I'm getting astray from the business. I'm getting astray from the model being a representation of the business. So uh, I don't like to do that. And therefore I'm really against these methods of trying to kind of simulate columnar in a row wise database by breaking it apart oneself, as opposed to using a columnar database uh, that, that does that automatically. And so I'm going to say that I don't, certainly in the logical modeling and the conceptual modeling, there's no difference modeling for a columnar versus a row wise. And I can't really think of a lot that I do differently when it comes to the physical level either. Now, obviously the implementation, the create table, the blah, 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 you know, when we get to there, that's going to be different. Um, but in terms of the model, I can't think of very much. Now, in terms of the load for most of my clients, and I would think for most people out there, the load is what the load is what the load is and the data as soon as the data is, is available most of the time at least today we're now thinking oh i got to get it loaded so if it's a trickle load we can do that now and that's what we do we don't batch it all up we don't wait for you know it to batch up overnight or in in you know two hour blocks or something like that like we used to do and load that so i think the load is whatever the load is and you just uh hope that the database can handle it William, a lot of around loading as well. Some of our customers that you know that use Kafka with Vertica, they call a micro batch loading. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a term, you know, talking in terms of like queuing up, whether it's like streaming data or what have you, to be able to maintain that kind of performance upon load. Yeah, good. And is the I uh, that the ID map that came in from the previous question? During the previous question, the question is: Is that the ID map? Uh huh. Is what the ID map? Sorry. That came in. Follow yeah. on. Yeah, it was a follow on. Yeah, it was a came. It came in when you were talking about uh... offsets. Yeah. Yes, the, the ID map is all about the offsets of where the records are within the data block from the beginning of the block. Awesome. And they are. They are a fixed length and notice how they are counted backwards from the end of the block. Okay, so we know the database manager knows where the, let's say the third ID map entry is because it's three times however big the ID map is, usually two bytes, sometimes one, uh, plus the size of any footers, which is usually one or two bytes. So that's how it knows where the offset is from the end of the page to where the offset is to where the record is or the column is, as the case may be, within the block. It's a beautiful thing. Beautiful. <laughs> I love it. Um, databases are beautiful. All right. Well, uh, and Colin Nur, um, thank you all for this great presentation and thank you for uh, this great information. Um, and that is all the time we have slated for this webinar. Uh, again, and thanks to Vertica for sponsoring today. And again, just a reminder, I will be uh, sending out a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides, links to the recording. Uh, thank you all. Thanks for our attendees for being so engaged and such great questions. And again, thanks to Vertica for sponsoring. William, thanks as always. Thanks, guys. <laughs>